Hey guys, welcome back. If you're new here, hi. My name is Jessica and welcome to my channel where I explore new true crime or creepy history topics each week. Last week we talked about Michelle Martinko and how it took 40 years and countless scientific advancements to finally solve her case. If you're interested in checking out that story when you're done here, I will make sure to have that video linked up here in the card for you. And if you're just interested in true crime or the macabre in general and you'd like to join me back here each week, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. Before we get into today's story, I do want to give you a heads up that this case involves sexual and physical torture. I don't go into much detail surrounding specifically what took place, but it's absolutely a main point of the story. And once you hear the charges, not much is left to the imagination. So if you are not in the headspace to hear about that right now, I completely understand and I urge you to do what is best for you. If that means clicking off this video, then please do so. I'm sure I'll catch you back here very soon for a different case. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the case of Brenda Sue Schaefer and Mel Ignato. And I'll tell you right out of the gate, it's rough and the outcome is pretty infuriating. So now that you're primed and ready for disappointment, let's get into it. Brenda Sue Schaefer was born on April 25th, 1952 in Louisville, Kentucky. She was the youngest of five children born to her parents, John and Essie Schaefer, and she is described as having been a very shy and introverted child. However, this did not prevent her from becoming incredibly friendly and well-liked. Growing up, Brenda's family was very religious, they attended church often, and over time this led to Brenda herself becoming very devoted to her own faith. She was also a very successful student, she maintained above average grades through her entire academic career. While attending high school in St. Matthews, Kentucky, Brenda met and fell in love with a young man named Pete. She was just a sophomore when they met, but their relationship progressed well beyond high school and the two actually ended up getting engaged. After high school, Brenda also briefly showed interest in a modeling career, but she ultimately settled on a path that I think most people would consider to be more stable. Brenda's mother suffered from lupus and after helping to care for her for so many years, Brenda started to feel really drawn to caring for others. She completed training to become a nurse's aide and she ultimately secured a job at a doctor's office where she was adored by her coworkers. She was personable and and dedicated and according to her boss, she was the best employee he'd ever had. Sadly, the Schaefer family was turned completely upside down in 1971 when Brenda's brother John was killed in the line of duty while working as a police officer. Brenda's family was very close-knit and they had a really difficult time processing this sudden loss. Brenda and her fiance even temporarily postponed their wedding because she was just too grief-stricken to focus on anything other than trying to cope. Eventually, she and Pete did tie the knot, but unfortunately, it did not result in the wedded bliss that everyone had been hoping for. Like all young couples, they quickly learned that they each still had a lot of growing up to do. Pete was irresponsible with money, he liked to drink, he cursed a lot, and occasionally he'd even partake in a little recreational use of the devil's lettuce. And while yes, all of these things collectively did upset Brenda, the biggest issue in their marriage was actually bedroom stuff. Brenda was really modest, and due to her religion, she'd often make herself feel guilty just for having sex. She was openly unhappy and wanted to end her marriage, but again, due to her religion, she and her family really struggled with the idea of divorce. Her parents, in particular, had a very conventional beliefs and wanted her to stick it out. In their opinion, she made a commitment, and it was her duty to do whatever she possibly could to honor it. But the final year of Brenda and Pete's marriage was particularly unhappy. They they argued constantly, and Brenda knew she just could not live like this for the rest of her life. So she ended her marriage, she packed up her few belongings, and she moved back home with her parents. Even though she knew it was the right decision, her divorce still weighed pretty heavily on her. She felt damaged, she hardly wanted to leave the house, let alone think about dating again. That is, until she met a successful, handsome young dentist named Jim Rush. Jim and Brenda met at a TGI Fridays, and they proceeded to fall hard and fast for one another. Jim especially was like borderline obsessed with Brenda. He would shower her with gifts and love letters. And one time he even took out a billboard near downtown Louisville to display a love letter to her. And although Jim was much more extravagant with his feelings, Brenda absolutely reciprocated. She loved every moment of attention she received from him and she too was head over heels in love, which is why I assume he was shocked when she refused to marry him. Shoot, you probably were too when you just heard that. Were you? Were you shocked? Well, there's a reason. You see, although their relationship seemed rock solid, she harbored some serious resentment towards Jim for his excessive drinking. So they proceeded to go back and forth, up and down, high and low, 
will they, won't they, for eight whole years before they finally decided that they'd both had enough. They agreed it was time to end their relationship and go their separate ways. And once again, Brenda found herself feeling very turned off to the idea of dating. Both of her previous relationships had ended badly and she just really didn't see the point in trying for anything serious again. But of course, we all know that usually the most transformative and impactful relationships you'll ever have tend to find you at precisely these points in your life. Whether they're life-changing in a good or a bad way, these are the ones that find you when you are not even looking for them. And that's exactly what happened to Brenda Sue Schaefer. Joyce Smallwood was Brenda's very best friend in the world. They looked alike, they acted alike, and they were both at very similar places in their lives. They were the definition of kindred spirits. So it hurt Joyce to see Brenda's self-esteem so low and her outlook on love so bleak. She was determined to help. She'd recently started seeing someone and she thought that maybe a double date with one of his friends could be just the pick-me-up that Brenda needed. So she asked if she was interested and knowing that she did need to do something to pull herself out of this funk, Brenda agreed. And on September 24th, 1986, Brenda and Joyce set off on their double date with Joyce's boyfriend, Bob, and Brenda's date, Melvin Henry Ignato. The group drove to Tartan's Landing in Prospect, Kentucky, and one by one, they loaded onto Mel's boat for a quick evening trip around the marina. Although Brenda was not immediately physically attracted to Mel, looks aren't everything, and she actually ended up really hitting it off with him. She even agreed to go back out on his boat the following day for a solo date. Mel seemed really genuine and sweet, and I mean his Corvette, his boat, his nice house, and his good job certainly didn't hurt. Not to say that Brenda was materialistic in any way, but she'd struggled financially before, so given the fact that Mel was older and successful and well-off, Brenda couldn't help but be intrigued by him. They began steadily dating, and for a while, things seemed really good. But the longer and longer they were together, the more and more possessive Mel seemed to become of her. For example, Mel was a traveling salesman, often taking trips to Taiwan and China, and while he was gone, he would literally schedule out he and Brenda's phone calls. Brenda was required to either call him or to be available to take his call at all of these pre-designated times or else he would lose his shit. Even if she was just one minute late, he would completely freak out on her, which that had to be stressful, right? Trying to calculate the time difference between Kentucky and fucking Taiwan and hope that you can manage to get a phone call connected in time down to the minute in 1986? I'm stressed out just thinking about it and I don't even have to do it. Anyways, Brenda's family seemed to be the first people to really wise up to Mel and what kind of person he truly was. And they pretty quickly grew to really hate him. They thought he was rude and narcissistic, and overall they found him to just be way too controlling of Brenda. Despite this though, Brenda didn't feel as though she and Mel had any real issues until he started demanding things from her sexually that she was just not comfortable with. Remember, Brenda was uncomfortable with just regular sex. So when Mel started talking about bondage and group sex, let's just say Brenda was not into it. Now, I'm not personally saying that there's anything wrong with someone wanting to partake in bondage or group sex or anything else that's traditionally considered taboo. If it's consensual between two adults and it's what you're both into, I'm not here to yuck your yum. The problem was that Brenda was very open about the fact that she was not interested in these things. And instead of respecting her boundaries and dropping it, Mel instead insisted that she loosen up by taking little sex tablet pills that he provided her. And even though she was weary, Mel had quite a hold over her. So she obliged and she took them. And after she did, it was lights out. The next thing she knew, she woke up naked with absolutely no memory of what had happened to her following when the pills kicked in. And as if that isn't abhorrent enough, Mel is also reported to have tried to use chloroform to relax Brenda on multiple occasions. Understandably, this this stuff really stressed Brenda out and made her feel unsafe around Mel. She hated that he was so persistent about sex and that he continued to insist that she go along with these fetishes of his. She was embarrassed and she had no idea what to do, so desperately, she turned back to Joyce. She confided in her what she'd been going through with Mel and she asked her for her advice. And Joyce, being a good friend, was adamant that Brenda end her relationship with Mel Ignato as soon as humanly possible. But if you've ever been in a relationship like this, which I hope to God you haven't, but if you have, you know that it's just not that easy. 
these people get a power over you and you feel stuck and completely out of control. So being told to just leave isn't always enough. There are entire organizations that are solely dedicated to helping people escape their abusive partners. So if you're one of those people who think it's as easy as just leaving, you're wrong. And an asshole, but that's just my personal opinion. Brenda did ultimately come to the conclusion that she really wasn't in a good or safe situation and she knew she needed to get out. She spoke openly to her friends, her family, and her coworkers about her plans to leave Mel. She even went as far as to contact her ex-boyfriend, Jim Rush, to help with her plans to escape. And eventually, knowing what she needed to do and knowing that she had a small army behind her, Brenda finally got up the courage to leave Mel and never look back. On September 21st, 1988, she'd finally done it. She'd broken things off with Mal, and she was soon to be free of him, once and for all. All she had to do was meet up with him the following week to return some of his things. She had some jewelry and stuff of his that he'd asked to get back, so she was going to return that stuff to him, and that would be it. The nightmare was seemingly almost over, but sadly for Brenda, the real nightmare had only just begun. Left devastated and furious after their breakup, Mel contacted an old friend of his to help him through, a woman he dated prior to Brenda, a woman named Marianne Shore. Before Mel had met Brenda, he and Marianne dated for a few years, during which time Marianne had fallen madly in love with Mel. He provided her a level of attention and security that she had never had from a man before. She truly believed that she'd found the love of her life and her life partner in Mel. So she was completely shocked and emotionally destroyed when Mel ended their relationship. Even after they broke up, Marianne had no interest in anyone else. She loved Mel and she wanted nothing more than to have him back. A fact that Mel was well aware of and proceeded to take full advantage of. He kept Marianne on the hook for quite some time following their breakup. He kept in constant contact with her and would frequently call her up when he wanted to have sex, even if he was seeing other people. And this gave Marianne hope that eventually the two would end up back together. But things changed when Mel started seeing Brenda. He seemed to only have eyes for her and Marianne was sickeningly jealous of her. She knew that with Brenda around, her chances of ever getting Mel back to herself were more or less non-existent. So she was thrilled to find out that the two of them had broken up for good. And she was completely unfazed a few days later when word started to spread that Brenda Sue Schaefer was missing. Brenda was reported missing on September 25th, 1988, by her brother Tommy and his girlfriend Linda. They were concerned when she'd never returned back to her parents' house after leaving for her meeting with Mel. Her car was subsequently discovered abandoned along the westbound lane of Interstate 64. The right tire was flat, the car had been broken into, the radio was missing, and small amounts of blood were scattered all over the back seat. There was also an unidentified handprint on the back tailpipe. Because of this, police were fearful pretty much right away that this was more than just a missing persons case. The next day, a group of those closest to Brenda met at the Schaefer family home to show their support to John and Essie. It was a really difficult time for anyone that was connected to the Schaefer family. Everyone was really worried and emotional about Brenda's disappearance, especially Mel. Yeah, he showed up even though ain't nobody want him there. And to add insult to injury, he spent the whole time sobbing and wailing and acting just completely over the top. He was doing the absolute most. This made the main detective on the case incredibly suspicious of him pretty much right from the start. Not only was he the last person known to have seen her after having recently had his heart shattered by her, but now here he is acting a damn fool in the middle of her parents' living room, clearly trying to prove to everyone that he's the most sad that she's missing. Stupid. Detectives first formally interviewed Mel in his home following his performance at the Schaefer's. He explained that yes, he and Brenda had plans to meet up, that they were planning to have one last conversation to properly close out their relationship, and that at that time, Brenda had also been planning to return his jewelry to him. He claimed that she'd picked him up around 3 p.m., even though this was not usual for them. Typically, he'd drive, but his Corvette was having tire problems, even though he'd literally just driven it to the Schaefer's 
so I guess that's neither here nor there. Then, according to Mel, he and Brenda drove around for a while. They'd made a couple of miscellaneous stops before she dropped him off at his mother's house around 11.30 p.m. During this interview, he desperately tried to buddy up to the police officers working Brenda's case. But unfortunately for Mel, the harder he tried, the more guilty he looked. The investigators did not trust Mel as far as they could throw him. He was just too much. He was too friendly and too eager. He asked too many questions and he just seemed too desperate to prove his innocence, which ironically made him look super guilty. They were pretty confident almost immediately that Mel was responsible for Brenda's disappearance. The problem was that there was little to no physical evidence to prove it. And the bigger problem was that while a lack of evidence will stall the police, it certainly won't delay the media. And because of this, Mel was pretty quickly found guilty in the court of public opinion. Because newspapers published intimate and personal details about his relationship with Brenda and made mention of the fact that he was the last person known to have seen her, it seemed like overnight it got to a point that Mel couldn't even walk outside without people whispering and pointing the finger at him. He got super paranoid because of this and in turn became even more hell-bent on proving to everyone that he'd been wrongfully accused. That he understood how it looked, but it didn't matter because he had not done anything to hurt Brenda. So prosecutor Scott Cox decided, maybe we call his bluff. He contacted Mel and offered him the opportunity to clear his name once and for all by voluntarily going in front of a grand jury, an offer that Mel's lawyer was vehemently against, as I'm sure any lawyer would be, because the bar is set real low when it comes to what is enough proof to indict someone. A grand jury only has to find that there is probable cause to believe that a defendant committed a crime in order to secure an indictment. Oh, and unlike during an actual trial, the defendant does not get to present any proof to back up their claimed innocence. So if you're gonna do that, better be real sure. And Mel was. He went against the advice of his attorney and he agreed. He knew it was the only way to clear his name and he was more than willing to take the risk. And on October 16th, 1989, Mel waltzed his lanky ass into the federal courthouse ready to provide his testimony. The questioning started out cordial enough, but it very quickly took a dark turn when prosecutor Cox started really digging into Mel's sex life. He asked him questions about his specific sexual fetishes and he made him admit just how long he'd actually actually waited to have sex with someone after finding out that Brenda had disappeared. He explained that he'd waited a few months, but that he'd only started having sex again, specifically with Marianne Shore, for emotional support. He then continued to try and garner sympathy by talking about his failing health and his financial struggles and blah, blah, blah. But no matter how many times Prosecutor Cox had to redirect the conversation, Mel never wavered. No matter what, he maintained, under oath, mind you, that he had never and would never hurt Brenda. And annoyingly, Mel testified really, really well. He came across as straightforward and honest, and even the prosecution was surprised by just how well he'd done. He walked out of his testimony feeling especially optimistic about how things had played out. And he may have been right to feel that way. If Marianne Shore hadn't crumbled into literal dust during her subsequent interview with police. Investigators met with Marianne Shore in her home on January 9th, 1990, just a few short months after Mel's grand jury testimony. She sat down with them, accompanied by her lawyer, and they all talked for hours. Things were going pretty much as you'd expect them to go when all of a sudden her lawyer heavily implied that Marianne might know where Brenda's body was. A fact that no one, and I mean no one, saw coming. But once that teeny tiny crack had formed in Marianne's story, all they had to do was press just a little harder before she completely broke and told police everything. She explained that Brenda was not just missing, but that she had in fact been murdered and that her murder was very, very premeditated. It started when Mel had given her a shopping list of all of the specific items he wanted her to acquire in order for him to torture Brenda. He then pre-dug a hole that he intended to bury her body in, and then he and Marianne even went as far as to scream test her house. Yes, Mel stood outside in various parts of the yard and had Marianne scream as loud as she possibly could so that he could be sure that once the screams were real, they wouldn't be heard. Then on the night of the actual murder, Mel lured Brenda to Marianne's home 
where he overpowered her and bound her to a coffee table. Then he proceeded to physically and sexually torture her, all while Marianne stood by and took photos. And when he was finally done abusing this poor woman, he took her to Marianne's bedroom where he suffocated her with chloroform. He and Marianne then folded up her body, tied it together, and buried it in a garbage bag in the hole that Mel had previously dug. Yeah, I told you, it's a lot. But shocking and fucking appalling as this revelation was, at this point, it was just Marianne's word against Mel's. Mel had taken the film from the camera and made sure to dispose of the remaining evidence. So all Marianne had was a story. And police knew that Marianne wouldn't be considered a reliable source by most people's standards. They knew they were going to need something more. So they propositioned her. They asked her if she would be willing to wear a wire and see if maybe she could draw a recorded confession out of Mel. And in a desperate attempt to save her own ass, she agreed. She called Mel to set up a meeting, and although it did take some convincing, he finally agreed to meet her in the parking lot of a local ice cream shop. They met in Mel's car around 4.40 p.m., and during their conversation, Marianne tried desperately to guide Mel into providing some sort of a statement that would corroborate her story. But the best she was able to get out of him was, quote, the place we dug is not shallow, so don't let it get you rattled, unquote. And while we might hear this and think, okay, what are you waiting for? Arrest him. Just me. It really wasn't that cut and dry. There was a lot of debate between investigators about if this conversation actually contained enough to arrest Mel. And they were really torn. So much so that they decided they'd be better off to wait on making an arrest until they actually found Brenda's body. And with that, Around 6 p.m. that very same evening, a few detectives went back in the woods behind Marianne's house, and after hours of videotaping, photographing, and recording what they believed to be a crime scene, they started digging. This was extremely difficult and physically exhausting work. The land was wet and swampy, and it seemed like no matter what they did, they were just not making any progress. And just before midnight, the search actually had to be terminated. Even though they hadn't found Brenda's body like they'd been hoping, the lead investigator on her case could not stomach the idea of Mel walking free for even one more day. He still wanted to make the arrest. So he pushed and pushed and pushed, and finally at 2 a.m., he was granted an arrest warrant for Mel Ignato. And by 2.30 a.m., he was pounding on Mel's door and slapping handcuffs on his wrists. Mel was charged with murder, kidnapping, sodomy, sexual abuse, robbery, and tampering with evidence, and his bail was set at $500,000. Brenda's body was found bound and buried the next day, exactly as Marianne had described it. Because of her statements and the validity of the information that she gave to police, Marianne was simply charged with tampering with evidence. She pled guilty to this charge and was sentenced to five years in the Kentucky Correctional Institute for Women, of which she would serve three. She was released in 1995. Mel's trial began in February 1992, but due to the outrageous media coverage it had garnered, it had to be moved from Louisville, Kentucky to Covington, Kentucky. It was prosecuted by Ernie Jasmine, who focused heavily on the recorded conversation between Mel and Marianne, as well as on Marianne's personal testimony. Unfortunately for the prosecution, Marianne was really unlikable. She was caught lying on the stand at one point and also smirked and smiled during parts of her testimony, which really rubbed jurors the wrong way. The defense countered that there was simply no physical evidence linking Mel to Brenda's death. There were no fingerprints, no DNA, no marks on Mel. There was nothing to definitively tie him to this murder. Even so, by the time closing arguments concluded, everyone was pretty sure that Mel was headed to prison. The prosecution was even hoping to secure the death penalty. However, after all of the testimonies and evidence had been presented over the 11-day trial, the jury returned with their verdict. They had found Mel Ignato not guilty of the murder of Brenda Sue Schaefer. So what was the deal? Was Mel innocent all along? Just the easiest suspect available? A man very nearly railroaded by police in an investigation led with tunnel vision? Or did he just get away with murder? Because remember, not guilty does not mean innocent. Rather that the jury simply did not believe there was enough evidence to convict him of murder beyond a reasonable doubt. Regardless of the truth though, Mel Ignato walked out of the courtroom that day a free man. But it wasn't 
all sunshine and rainbows. The investigation and trial had financially devastated Mel. Huh. He was even forced to sign over his home to his attorney to satisfy his legal fees. Not that any of us care, but he was left with virtually nothing and forced to move in with his son. But here's where shit takes a turn. Soon after acquiring the home, Mel's attorney sold it. And once the new owners moved in, they began to renovate some of the older and more dated aspects of the home, specifically the carpet. It was old and brown and dingy and they wanted it gone. I don't know why, it sounds chic. Nevertheless, they scheduled the installation of their new carpet for that coming October. And on October 1st, when the workers began pulling the carpet up, they stumbled upon a hidden and very difficult to reach air vent. And located inside said air vent was a Ziploc bag that contained three rolls of undeveloped film, as well as a ring, a necklace, and a tennis bracelet. Given the history of the house, the new homeowners contacted the police, who immediately came out to retrieve the film for processing. And when the images came back, it became very apparent that everyone on the jury at Mel's trial had fucked up. Those photos showed Brenda Schaefer tied to a coffee table, bound, gagged, and posed exactly the way Marianne Shore had said she'd been. All in all, they were covered 112 pictures, each more horrifying than the last. And in the background of each of these photos, you could see a man's torso, legs, and crusty old balls. But whoever the photographer was had done their due diligence not to capture the face of the mystery man. Even so, we all know who this man is, and so did police. The identity of this creepo was never the issue. No, the glaring issue at hand was that Mel had been acquitted of Brenda's murder. And under the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment, he could not be retried for it. But obviously they couldn't ignore these photos and pretend this never happened. Some form of justice, adequate or not, had to be served. So they got creative. They went after him for the one thing they possibly could. A technicality, if you will. Remember, Mel had gone in front of the federal grand jury and under oath made the statement, I did not kill Brenda Sue Schaefer, which obviously we now know was a big fat lie. So even if he couldn't be recharged with her murder, he could be charged with perjury. So police made their way to rearrest Mel, who since his murder trial had done his best to keep a low profile. They rolled out, picked him up and escorted him down to the Louisville FBI headquarters where he was ordered to strip completely naked. Ironically, he threw a huge fit about this, which is sickening when you consider all of the things he put Brenda through. Guess he's a real dish it out, but can't take it kind of guy. I don't know why, but him throwing a fit about this makes my blood boil. Anyways, when they finally got him to stop whining and do as he was told, he was instructed to stand naked in various positions in order to get photos to compare as closely as possible to the originals. And you're likely not surprised that when viewed side by side, the photos matched up identically. Mel was then confronted with this information and on October 2nd, 1992, he finally confessed to the murder of Brenda Sue Schaefer. He was sentenced to eight years in prison for perjury. And before he was taken away, he was given the opportunity to make one final statement, which he took stating, quote, I assume total responsibility for what I did. What I did was wrong and horrible. And there are reasons, but I'm not going to get into that because there are no excuses. I just wanted to say to Brenda's family that I am very sorry this happened. I know all the pain and sorrow and suffering I have caused you. I have felt it myself, and I want to apologize to my own family for the same reason. I want to also apologize to law enforcement agencies and to the judicial system, local, county, state, and federal, for all the grief and burden I've caused them. It was not my intent to do that. I just hope and pray that all of you will forgive me as I ask for forgiveness from God. And I hope that there's some unknown way that God will bring about some good from this. Because I know the Bible says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love. Unquote. The Schaefers, much like I'm sure we all are, were just completely disgusted by him. Mel then went on to serve only five years of his eight year sentence because he was credited time served for time he'd already spent in prison awaiting his murder trial. After he was released in 97, the state prosecuted him again for additional lies they realized that he'd told under oath. 
Ultimately, he was sentenced to nine additional years in prison before he was freed for good in 2006 at the age of 68. Marianne Shore died in 2004 at the age of 54 from heart complications, and Mel Ignato died on September 1st, 2008 at the age of 70. He died alone in his apartment after, in a sweet moment of serendipity, his walker gave out and he tripped and fell into a glass coffee table and bled to death. Now, obviously there was no real justice served in this case. But you can't tell me that it's not slightly poetic that after everything he put Brenda through on a coffee table, he died because of a coffee table. I'm telling you, people that don't believe in karma, tell them this story. It'll at least make them wonder. Brenda's family did their best to heal after all of this. They remained incredibly close and tried desperately just to heal and live happily. But I think we can all agree that they were likely never the same. And sadly, that about wraps us up for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. Before you head out, make sure you give this video a thumbs up. It only takes a second and it really helps out the channel a lot, so thanks in advance. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. It's also probably not a bad idea to turn on your post notifications as well. I am not great at posting on the same day every week, so having that turned on will ensure that you never miss an upload. I do put out new true crime or creepy history content each week, so I would love to catch you back here in my next video. Until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys.